Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Vecchi. I'm the field CTO at Veronis. And uh, today we're going to be talking about fighting where they aren't, how attackers avoid endpoints in modern attacks. And with me uh, is one of the smartest guys I know, uh, Sneer Ben Shamal. Hi, Sneer. Hey, Brian. Thank you. Uh, so, hey everyone, my name is Sneer Ben Shamal. I'm overseeing the uh, cybersecurity practice in Veronis, uh, managing the data science, research, uh, forensics, and security operations team. Uh, and pleasure to be here with you. So, Brian, thank you. Let's get started. Of course. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a little bit of background on kind of what we're talking about and a little bit of context, uh, the kinds of attacks that, um, that, that totally avoid endpoints. And so many of us are focused on endpoint protection these days. We're going to go through four specific uh, kill chain specific attacks, and we'll give some examples of those, a gateway compromise, a supply chain compromise, uh, compromise in the cloud, as well as uh, we'll cover some insider threats as well. And then right at the end, we'll give you a little uh, taste of some bonus content that we've got uh, where uh, an attack technique that doesn't bypass or avoid the endpoints, but goes right through them using office macros. So with that, let's, let's, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about attacks that avoid endpoints? And the, the key thing here is we tend to focus from a security perspective, and by we, I mean enterprises in general, at the perimeter, building big, strong fences. And one of the primary perimeters these days, especially in a world where everybody is remote and uh, you know, ex expected to access data from anywhere, from any device at any time, we tend to focus on endpoint protection. But what a lot of attackers these, are, are doing these days, especially sophisticated ones, is totally avoiding those endpoints. Why worry about bypassing the EDR when you can just use a technique that never even touches the endpoint at all. And this quote from Sun Tzu uh, from The Art of War illustrates that. If, if, you know, if you attack where they're unprepared, then you'll attack where they're not expected. Many of us are prepared for attacks on endpoints and devices, just like we are at the perimeter. So if an attacker can avoid those, then uh, they're much better off and they're often much more successful. Let's start with the first example of these kinds of attacks, which is a gateway compromise. So a gateway is any way into the network, like a firewall, a VPN, or some sort of device or service that is by definition and by design exposed to the internet and designed to let people in and out. Uh, when a gateway is vulnerable, whether it's a VPN, a, a remote access server, a firewall specifically, uh, when a gateway is vulnerable, you basically you give an attacker a beachhead onto your environment. So what are some examples of gateway compromises that you guys have seen? Yeah, so... To be honest, many threat actors, uh, initial access is an exposed server or an exposed application, not like directly into one of your users' uh, devices. And this is a great example. The Fortinet uh, vulnerability um, that was disclosed, actually, this is a great story. This vulnerability was disclosed two years ago and like three years ago even, but you have like thousands of customers that were still vulnerable. The vulnerability includes like a direct access to your one of your Fortinet gateways. And that direct access exposes a specific file with tons of clear text credentials of the users and sometimes the services that using this specific uh, gateway. So in this case, the attacker can uh, compromise one or several of those uh, uh, credentials and access your organization directly through the gateway. So you don't need any phishing. You don't need any to compromise any specific uh, account, social engineering, you don't need to go into the endpoint, you just access through the gateway uh, using different type of vulnerability. The cool thing about these vulnerabilities, is just like, you know, you expose credentials and we have those type of vulnerabilities all the time. Um, this is a great uh, uh, metrics that uh, Kayla a Research Group just uh, published this year. And they show that initial access for sale in the deep web uh, uh, was increased. And so as you can see, almost half of the uh, in initial access uh, is RDP, open RDP, VPN access, uh, any type of remote code executions or vulnerabilities from different type of network appliances or application servers. Uh, so what those threat actors are doing is they're scanning the network. They're looking for any type of known vulnerability that you didn't patch one of your servers or some organization that have open RDP access and they just uh, uh, maintain their foothold, exploiting this vulnerability and just, uh, they don't want to go and move forward with full compromise and full APT. 
to just sell it to specific threat actors mm -hmm. that care about, okay, I have this company, I have these like several companies, I want to implement the ransomware, I want to extol them. If you heard about like the dark side group that using initial access as the main tactics, or uh, this is something we just discussed about in one of our blog posts lately uh, last month, or if we're seeing things like the Arrival or those type of threat actors that using ransomware after the end game, which is exfiltrating information, the using initial access as the first a, a foothold within the organization. And again, it's it's so easy because let's talk a little bit about patching, Brian. Mm -hmm. We have so many vulnerabilities and we have so many investigations, so many customers that we help them during, uh, during attack, our incident response and forensics team jumping in. And then we identified that patient zero and the first initial access of the threat actor was through an open RDP server or uh, those type of vulnerability I just listed here are very common for specific threat actors, most of the threat actors to scan your network and identify those initial access. Most of the time, and, and I, I do want to uh, talk about, for example, the proxy logon. If you have an on-prem exchange server, um, uh, Microsoft and Athnium, uh, 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 Microsoft, Athnium expo um, exploited uh, uh, Athnium exploited Microsoft vulnerabilities on prem exchange servers and were able to remotely run execution of code from that exchange server. A few investigation we did on victims, we saw from those specific servers the attacker went all the way into the domain controllers and all the way into additional servers because mm -hmm. the exchange server was like. You have so many permissions. Those service accounts, those accounts that you compromise have so many permission already. And you can just laterally move into the, the best and the, like the interesting, uh, most secure asset within the network. Yeah, we often think of the gateway as a really hard outer shell. But if there's some sort of gateway compromise, either through an unpatched server or other exploit, the attacker is going to have free reign. Here's generally how it works. is An attacker is going to come through one of these gateways either through using an exploit that hasn't been patched or by brute forcing a VPN account. Once inside though, there's a few different techniques that they're gonna use. They're generally gonna to jump to another on-prem server. Uh, they will use DNS for reconnaissance. Uh, they'll use DNS for command and control. They'll also use Active Directory to escalate their privileges, move laterally. The goal of course is to get access to exfiltrate, sometimes encrypt data. So the gateway becomes a beachhead, but at no point during this kill chain did an attacker have to worry about any end, any endpoint protection that you might have. Brian, I can't see any endpoint in in this in this yeah. diagram, right? It's like no endpoint in the diagram. Here. And and I do want to mm -hmm. I do want to uh, just share one insight. Patching, mm -hmm. patching is you always have lagging in patching. So even if you try to patch right before the critical LC is like being published. This LC already exists few weeks or sometimes months before the vendor released the patch. So you need to assume that your external facing service and application can be compromised. And we do see a lot of companies that cannot patch the day after when you have a massive infrastructure. It's always, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. And this is like one of the factors that allow those threat actors to get a hold of one of your externally facing servers. All right, so what happens when patching is uh, not just a fix of the problem, but maybe a cause of the problem, a supply chain compromise? Let's talk about sunburst and solar winds. So what happened here is the way solar winds uh, normally works, and the idea of a supply chain compromise is a compromise somewhere in an infrastructure uh, that get, gets compromised outside of your control. So you've got solar winds uh, to help manage your network. Solar winds talks to the broader internet to get patches uh, through the Orion uh, protocol. These attackers got a hold of or got access to the patching server and were able to compromise these uh, a DLL that was sent down to how many uh, SolarWinds environments was it? Something like 30,000? A lot, a lot. Yeah. Like everyone that pretty much updated the Orion software was vulnerable and actually had that malicious DLL. So if we want to talk a little bit more in depth about mm -hmm. the, the attack grind, which if you ask me, I'm so fascinated about this specific attack is is insane the thing is the thing is like they actually were able to hack solar wind and from solar wind it was 
like just spread around the entire, so in, instead of attacking your organization directly, you just need to attack one supply chain and then your malicious code can be distributed for all the customers. Uh, the cool thing about here is the command and control and the stealthy operation. They use DNS mainly in order to beacon from all those victims outside to their external servers. And that DNS was so stealthy because they waited a few weeks and then they sent some beaconing outside using their own code from the solo wind server, which is particularly very noisy. And it, once they identify one of the victims they needed to attack and they want to get the information, a, a great example is like Microsoft. An additional example is some of the, the uh, defense, uh, 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 like uh, the National uh, Treasury Departments of the United States and so on, uh, something very juicy. So they communicate from uh, the DNS protocol to uh, be able to operate the entire operation through the DNS. Mm -hmm. a laterally move, establish foothold for many, many weeks and months, and identify sensitive information using the SolarWeed server. They identify sensitive information and they exfiltrate that information slowly uh, outside of the network. Uh, it was like really genius. Yeah, so we've gone through two attack techniques that involve attackers coming in from the outside, totally, and as you see, still no endpoints that are involved in this attack flow, coming in from the outside, either through a gateway or through some sort of supply chain compromise. But there's another way to get access to data that can potentially bypass the endpoint. And uh, that's going through, uh, not just, uh, it, it's going through this, this infrastructure, right? So we've got an internal server, the SolarWinds infrastructure, that talks to the broader internet, and it talks to the internet to get updates. The way the supply chain compromise works is the, the supply chain update server sends down a compromised update. In the SolarWinds case, it was a DLL that had been compromised. From there, as you say, DNS for reconnaissance and command and control or command and control over HTTPS. Those protocols are always there. From there, uh, the, our attackers might use Active Directory for privilege escalation or to move laterally around the network. We might be sensing a theme here and then get access to exfiltrate uh, and or encrypt data. This is another beachhead, another foothold that an attacker can get. And as you say, no endpoint in this diagram. Both of these, the gateway compromise and the supply chain compromise involved attackers coming in from the outside to your data center, to some infrastructure that you control. But what about just going to infrastructure that you have less control of, like a cloud application? So another way to get access to data is to go into a cloud data store and access it that way. And one of the ways we've seen attackers do that recently is by building a malicious cloud application. So the idea is if I'm an attacker, I build an application in Azure and I publish it and then uh, send it to your users. Your users install the application, grant that application permissions to access data or other systems. And then as an attacker, I leverage those application permissions to get access to and potentially exfiltrate your data. So in this case, the, uh, the, the specific technique that we're talking about is building a malicious Azure application and then using that Azure application to get access to Office 365 or Microsoft 365 data. So Sneer, how does this actually work? So even in continuation to SolarWind hack, we also saw some evidence uh, uh, disclosed by Malwarebytes and Microsoft because there were like also some of the victims uh, that the attacker actually tried to leverage those type of malicious application techniques in order to remain inside and get some additional foothold. So the idea is exactly like mobile app. When you install a mobile app, and if you remember back in the days, the flashlight that asks you permission and consent to access your contacts and geographic location from your mobile device, why the, uh, this specific uh, flashlight application needs all those permission. Exactly the same way malicious application as well as working. So when you install this application, uh, the, what we're seeing in the field is we're seeing threat actors having their own Microsoft tenant building their own application. And the idea of the application, some of them is to harvest information from different type of organizational tenants by luring uh, users to install those applications. And Microsoft best practices is to allow your user to use the Microsoft Azure application and to install them. Once the user installed the application, it's been requested to uh, provide permission to the application to do specific type of things. Those things normally use the Microsoft Graph, Graph API. And this is a great example of some of the POC we build uh, based on some of the incident we saw, 
when you have Microsoft Graph API, you mainly use the permission of the victim that installed the application and you can run those Graph API on behalf of the permission of that specific user. So you create a service principle in the victim organizational tenant and that service principle have the rights of the victim user. Uh, so remotely, it's exactly like a malware. From remote, you can just run a, a graph API call, uh, collect information about additional username and tenant information. You can get some data information from OneDrive, from SharePoint Online. You can uh, extract email addresses. And in some cases, unfortunately, we saw that the user had permission to run Graph API to perform changes. Some of the some of the incident we saw when you install that malicious application, the attacker were able to execute a, a commands like deleting or sharing or downloading or even a, a tampering information in your Office 365. So we, we actually use Graph API to access specific files and change the content of the files. And it's, it's just like, it's, it's insane when one user in your organization can do just by approving and downloading an application. Again, the best practices, specifically in Azure and Microsoft is like, yeah, we support the collaboration. We want the user to download any type of application you want. So you have some best practices about, a, you know, how can you reduce the impact? A, and you have a lot of information about how can you track down the installation of those type of application. So we build a full POC with full explanation and in-depth information about how everything works and what should you do in order to protect yourself. A, you can go to our Veronix blog mm -hmm. and you have all the information over there. And yeah, again, if you way, have any questions, right, Brian, this is a live session. I was, so, I was just going to say the exact same thing. If you've got questions while we're going through this, please ask them in the Q&A and we're going to be here uh, answering them. Uh, so you thought, listen, our minds went to the exact same place at the same time. Forgot to mention that up front. So yeah, if you'd like more information, veronis.com slash blog, search for Azure Apps, and we built a proof of concept. Also, you may have read the news, Malwarebytes uh, got hit by something similar uh, a little while back. So we've got cloud uh, uh, techniques to access data through the cloud, bypass all your endpoints because we're going straight to cloud data, come in through a gateway or a supply chain compromise infrastructure that you've already got. Uh, either unpatched or it gets hit by a malicious patch. Um, but what's another way to bypass the controls that you have on an endpoint? Well, what if somebody's already logged in, completely authenticated, and is supposed to be using that endpoint? Uh, insider threats and insiders bypassing your endpoint controls is something that we've seen a lot of as well. And you may have read uh, back in December, uh, Tesla hired an employee and within a couple of days of that employee starting, they detected that a large amount of intellectual property, other proprietary information was being uploaded to his Dropbox account. Uh, I'm not trying to pick on Tesla here. This kind of thing happens all the time. We do risk assessments as a matter of course. Yeah, every week we do risk assessments. Uh, on average, uh, a given organization, about 20% of the data is open to every single employee and service account, meaning you hire a new employee and on day one, they have access to 20% of the data in the company. Uh, and every once in a while, you're going to hire someone who either breaks bad or is there by design. And in this case, this attacker got himself hired at Tesla and then used that access to start exfiltrating data right away. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it illustrates that code and intellectual property, of course, have a lot of value. There's also other really sensitive information inside files uh, like uh, PII and PHI and related data. Employees often have access to way more data than they need to, in order to do their jobs. We talk a lot about enforcing least privilege, and we also know that most organizations really, really struggle uh, to do that. And humans can be <laughs> vulnerable to compromise. Uh, so, you know, patch frequently and make sure that you're that you're not just monitoring uh, perimeter behavior, but you're also monitoring user behavior in a way that's going to let you detect when something goes wrong. So, so a Brian, way to think. I Go ahead. I, I do. I, I do want to to mention another thing. Is like you just said, like every user in the organization can access for like twenty percent of the data is open to everyone. And the idea here is like you don't need to do any type of privilege escalation. I want to take it for two different mm -hmm. uh, two different concepts. Think about the ransomware. When you compromise one generic domain account, and you want to unleash a ransomware. 
that domain account of over usually 20% of your entire data within your organization is uh, available to the entire organization. So as a minimum, 20% of the data will be encrypted without any type of privilege escalation. The second thing is uh, the not so smart employee, employees that sniffing around, employees that thinks like, hey, I don't need to use X, Y, and Z. I'm just going to take all the data because I, I, I want to work faster. I want to work from home. I want to use my own device and my own computer. And you have so many ways for those not so smart employees to take the data without running and ex, ex, extra trading in a, a, a successful way during DNS tunneling. Just taking that data out, it's so easy today. So insider trade is, for me, one of the largest uh, risks factor uh, uh, for trade detection and response and for organization today. So how, how it looks like if you just hire an attacker, Brian? Yeah, the attacker's already got access to your endpoint, has access to uh, the data that they're supposed to have access to, and probably a whole bunch of data that they're not supposed to have access to, or at least do not have a need to access. Oftentimes, we also see that once uh, an endpoint is compromised or once an employee is compromised, they can use, they can live off the land and use techniques like our outside attackers, leveraging DNS for reconnaissance and command and control to the outside, Active Directory to escalate their privileges and then get access to both on-premises and data in the cloud. So if we were to put all of this together, uh, Let's think about the anatomy of all of these attacks and what you would need to do to properly detect and better prevent them. So we've got our attacker who's either inside or outside or is a piece of malware like ransomware. This person or this code is after, or this group, right? A lot of these are being driven by large organizations at this point, are after data, either on premises or in the cloud. Nobody breaks into a bank to steal the pens, uh, they're after data. How do they get there? Well, they might come through a gateway. Uh, either an unpatched gateway, a compromised gateway, something that is exposed, uh, not necessarily by design. Uh, we saw a lot of exposed RDP during the beginning of COVID because companies were just trying to get people to work remotely. From there though, once they're through the gateway, they'll use DNS for command and control, Active Directory for privilege escalation and lateral movement, get access to on-premises data for exfiltration or encryption. Or they might come through your uh, supply chain somehow and compromise a server and then use all the same techniques. Uh, or they might go directly to your cloud data through a cloud directory, or they might hop from on-premises to the cloud or vice versa. They might go from authenticating to Azure Active Directory, for instance, and then using those credentials to get themselves active uh, access to on-prem data. Sneer's team runs a great attack lab that shows exactly how that can work. Or they might already have access to the endpoint because you hired them and they're inside. This also highlights what can happen when your endpoint actually is compromised. It doesn't mean that you, do, you shouldn't have endpoint protection uh, or EDR or other defenses on the endpoint. It is a perimeter that you do, do need to protect, but it's not a be all end all and it can be compromised. So what do you need to consider if you want to up your detective capabilities? What do you need to have in place in order to detect this kind of thing quickly? Time to detection and time to response are critical because the longer it takes you to figure out that something is going on and the longer it takes you to investigate it and come to a conclusion about what happened, the more vulnerable uh, you are, the more risk you are. Start with telemetry. So what are you actually monitoring? You need to monitor the data itself. It's very difficult or in some cases impossible to determine these kind, when these kinds of attacks are happening by just inferring data access from network or other telemetry. Watch the data itself, watch connections to the VPN and to the cloud. Uh, look at authentication traffic since that's going to indicate both device usage and lateral uh, lateral movement and privilege escalation. Watch DNS for command and control, potentially for exfiltration too. You can use a DNS tunnel to get data out. And of course, web connections to see uh, how users, which websites users are accessing and whether it's following any unnecessary data access. It's important to clean the data up because if you just dump all of these logs into a repository and hope that you can connect them together, that's incredibly difficult. But if you clean up the data and link various entities together, like users, what they're accessing, where they are, the internal and external IP addresses, it makes it much easier to use. But a big key here is it's not just about cleaning up all of this telemetry, it's about enriching it. It's really difficult to detect inappropriate access to data if the telemetry that you're looking at doesn't include things like the account role. Is this a user, an executive, a service account, or an administrator? Is the data that's being accessed sensitive in any way? Is what device are they using and where are they coming from? And this is just some examples. There's lots of ways to enrich data 
if you've got the right kind of metadata. And if you've got enough of this kind of enriched telemetry, you can then build really useful profiles. You know that this person is an executive, you know where they come from, the device that they use, you know what data they have access to, what they normally touch, who their peers are, whether any of that is sensitive so that when something goes wrong, you know about it. And the key thing here is uh, when something really does go wrong, it's gonna go wrong along a variety of factors. It's not just that somebody's logging in from a new location. That happens all the time because it's we're all working remote now, right? But if somebody's logging in from a new location using somebody else's device, touching data that they've never looked at, that's also highly sensitive. You put all that together and there's enough risk factors to tell you that there's abnormal access to sensitive data. And Sneer, what are the kinds of threat models? What are the kinds of analytics that you'd want to have in place in order to catch the kinds of attacks that we just went through? That's a great question, Brian. So some of the attacks, you don't need to exploit anything like Insider. Some of the things that we need to do is to enforce machine learning, AI, and historical knowledge about my organization, my users, application, and services. This is a great example. So let's start with like the first thing is like you need to get initial access. Sometimes you can detect it, sometimes not. But for example, potential malicious file download was detected. Um, if you know which type of websites, if you know how your users, the, uh, which devices they're coming from and how they're downloading and interacting with, with websites, you can identify things like droppers. Uh, moving forward, like things about DNS. DNS is the blood in the vein of the organization. It's always open. It's open externally. It's open internally. If you understand how DNS behave in between endpoints, in between servers, uh, what's your upstream DNS, downstream DNS? You can identify things like, hey, I'm using my DNS server for recon, like we're seeing a lot. Instead of going to AD, threat actors today asking the DNS server, hey, give me all the information about the devices in this segmentation. You can see here abnormal DNS reverse lookup requests to different IPs, even internally within the organization. You like The idea is that the threat actors always going, always going after the data. And here you can see like Active Directory attack, like privilege escalation. Um, we see like potential a, a ticket harvesting that can lead to a curb thing and compromise of a service account. And now you ask yourself a question, how can I tell if a service account have been compromised or if the service account is operating as usual? Here I can see that the service account access for the first time to a personal device. And Brian, again, I want people mm -hmm. to ask questions, right? So how do you know that this is a it's, it's a personal device or it's a server, how you can detect it? How do you know automatically that this account is a service account and executive accounts? Those are great questions you need to answer before you can provide those type of detection. And again, data is the key. That service account access a typical folders and a typical files contain sensitive information. The last but not least, what the CISO always asks, so what happened to the data? And this is why, again, we need web traffic, we need DNS to tell you, hey, during the time or during the time frame you access that sensitive data, we saw DNS tunneling or we saw a typical upload activity from this device or by this service account to those specific domains. And this is like a great example of a flow, both insiders threat and both of threat actors that we're seeing in many of our incidents. And how do you respond to the CISO that says, Sneer, this all sounds great, but I'm already suffering from alert fatigue. I've got so many alerts, I can't chase them. And what you're saying is I need more alerting. So how do we make sure that the alerts that we're getting are actually useful? So I will divide this type of question into two. The first one is, again, the machine learning and the behavior analytics. So we, you have specific pattern detection, but you need to have context. So if you will alert of every a user that access any type of data, you will be blasting your SIM and your SOC team with tons of alerts. But if you know what within that data, you can avoid alerting about people that just like, you know, a back uh, doing some backup of their mobile devices or uploading the latest Christmas party pictures to Dropbox. You need to understand what within those files and you need to understand if that user created those files if the user and the user peer normally access those files from which devices. By having this context, you will be able to filter out so much noise. So your alerts that you will provide uh, to your security analyst will have all the information they need, first of all, to decide if they need to investigate right now. They're already going to reduce all the false positive you can even imagine. And the second thing is like, I don't need to build so many correlations to determine if this is like a critical 
a incident or it's something I can resolve by myself because I have the context about the incident. What about the alerts themselves? So you mentioned context. When something like this happens, and here's an example of an alert for an abnormal service behavior, a service account accessing data that they don't touch. That's a really useful alert in, uh, for instance, you mentioned proxy logon for Exchange, where Exchange service accounts were used to access data on the network. Sunburst, where the Sunburst solar accounts and the system accounts on those services on those servers were used to access the network. You mentioned context, because when you get an alert like of something like that, a service account accessing data that it never touches, there's a lot of questions that are going to come up. Why is this happening? Is this something real? Was any data stolen? Was any data touched? So just what's, why, describe the importance of a lot of this context and how it helps lower the time to resolution here, not just the time to detection. Yeah, so, so my goal when I'm getting an alert is I need to understand, first of all, uh, who involved in this specific incident. Uh, if you look here, we already identified this, this account as a service account. And we already identified that this is a typical behavior for this specific service account. And this atypical behavior resides with files, but not only files, it also resides with devices. So we want to have a context about who is the service account. This is the backup service account. What was so different about it? You open a Microsoft documents for the first time in this specific location. And then you ask yourself, okay, from where is operate? Who is running this service account? You can go to the device information and you can clearly see that is running from a laptop that we learn and baseline that this laptop uh, is belong, is the primary device that being used by the username engineer. And this is a personal device. This device contains additional alerts that related to different type of threats on the same time, time frame. And this specific backup service account also related to different alerts related to the same time frame. Something that I always ask myself when it's related to administrative account or service account, if the accounts have been changed, if it's a new service account, if it's a disabled accounts that become enabled, this is additional context that we're adding here because it, today in security, you have so many options for false positives. And sometimes you waste so much time just to reduce those options. We need to get to a point that we enforce automation by mm -hmm. providing the context. It's, I call it automa automated forensics. If I will provide you all the answers you need on the alerts, everything you need to know about the data that have been compromised, everything you need to know about the user or the service that's involved in the incident, everything you need to know about the device that was involved in this incident, think about how much time you save to take action. That makes sense, right? I think it does. By the way, if you've got any questions, keep asking them. But here's a little bonus thought. So we've talked about how attackers can avoid endpoints. All of the kill chains and techniques that we just described, your endpoint protection really isn't going to do all that much to help you. There's lots of ways that attackers can completely avoid, avoid those protections. But what if they want to blow right through your endpoint? Well. We've got some content. You can go to our Security Forward channel on YouTube uh, that'll show you how to weaponize Office macros. Office macros are an incredibly powerful tool that can be used in very productive ways. Uh, in a very long ago past life, I used to build lots of Office macros for Excel analysis. Uh, but you can also use Office macros in really malicious ways uh, to get control of an endpoint and leverage them to your benefit. And if you'd like to see how uh, some of our practitioners can do that and teach you, you know, learn a little bit of how that works, check out Weaponizing Office Macros on our Security Forward YouTube channel. Uh, it's a really cool session and we've done some live workshops with it too. So what can you, uh, how can you apply what you've learned today? Well, it's really important to identify where you might be vulnerable, patch your servers, uh, do regular risk assessments, not just at your perimeters and on your endpoints, but on the data and infrastructure itself. Evaluate whether you can detect these attacks one of the things that SNEERS team does are purple team exercises where we'll break into your network and then show you how you could have or where you might have gaps in detection. Uh, whether you leverage us to do that kind of thing or somebody else, it's certainly worth doing. And again, consider performing a specific exercise, uh, either a red team or a red team blue team, where you will, or what we call a purple team, where you'll, uh, you'll look at your, both your detective capabilities as well as any protection gaps that you might have. Sir, so what else would you recommend people do, if anything? Um, do not trust your perimeter. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in so many like strategic conversations with CISOs and CIOs, and 
we're talking about like uh, the, like those type of attacks and sometimes i getting very uh, i'm getting very frustrated because those executives sometimes can tell you yeah but we have mfa we're we're immune we have mfa we have mfa enabled for all our cloud users we have mfa for our vpn access you know how many how many incidents we're seeing like all those accounts with very strong mfa you're always going to have this like one account that MSA, MFA was disabled or someone that using a service account to connect from the VPN or some sync proprietary accounts that you use to sync your on-prem and cloud data that not require MFA even as part of the best practices. But even if you have MFA today, you have a challenge response phishing attacks that can bypass or even avoid the MFA. So things like, hey, we have EDR, we can identify ransomware. But what about all those threat actors that using the supply chain or using your web server vulnerability without even accessing your endpoint to deploy ransomware and to exfiltrate information? The endpoint is not even part of the attack yield chain. So how can you even see those type of behaviors? Again, endpoint protection is a very important key in your security stack, but do not trust your perimeter. Uh, build security by layers. Think about what the attackers are looking for. At the end of the day, each and every attacker, insider, threat actor will go after the data. They want to encrypt your data or they want to steal your data or they want to view or tamper your data. If you have the right detection in place, you can detect those type of attacks from the data standpoint way before something bad can happen. Exactly. Nobody breaks into a bank, still depends. Make sure that your data is properly monitored and protected. And with that, uh, we'll close it up, uh, answer any more questions that have come through. Uh, Sneer, as always, thank you. I hope everybody out there is staying safe and you're enjoying RSA. This has been a pleasure for us, and we'd love to talk to you some more. If you'd like to know anything else, I'm Brian Becci. Uh, Sneer, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for your time. It was a pleasure.